Hello and welcome to the third talk in our fall program on race and representation, focusing on the impact of historical policy on the development of land grant universities, HBCUs, and the veterinary profession. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. John Thielen, University Research Professor of Higher Education and Public Policy at the University of Kentucky. For those joining us on Zoom, Please use chat for any questions and these will be answered at the end of the presentation. Now, I will turn it over to Dr. Thielen for his talk titled Land Grant Legacies, Prominence and Problems in American Higher Education from Past to Present. Thank you very much, Jenny. It's an honor to join you at North Carolina State University today. In the 19th century, hosts and hostesses had two fears about their guests. One would be that they had bad table manners and that they might steal the silverware. Well, I will try to be courteous. And today we're not so much worried about silverware as software. And I assure you, your software is safe. So uh, let us proceed on to our, our first uh, historic photograph. In many American campuses, as you walk around and look at the remarkable buildings, uh, you frequently see wonderful tributes to our land grant legacy. One of my favorites comes from University of California, Berkeley, Hillgard Hall, where you find not with poster board, but rather in marble inscribed the motto, to rescue for human society, the native values of rural life. What you cannot see well is that on top of the marble columns, there are the most wonderful bow relief of strands of grape, uh, shocks of wheat, uh, cattle, uh, all of these tributes to uh, the many services and programs uh, that our land grant universities have provided. So this is at least my starting point of inspiration. So now let's zoom in a little closer to the next slide. And through the miracles of, of Zoom, here we are at North Carolina State University. Now it's a little bit of a time warp because it's 1955. And uh, so on the one hand, some of it's familiar, but it's also historic. And uh, for me, it's a good starting point as we venture in closer. So, uh, and uh, Sarah, may I have the next slide, please? Uh, as your guest, I, I wish to pay special thanks to Dean Paul Lund, to Associate Dean Laura Nelson, to Dr. Alan Kennedy, to Dr. Diane Dunning, to Mike Charbonneau, to Dane Johnson, and in particular to Sarah McGee, and to Jenny Evans for your wonderful hospitality. Uh, I've enjoyed the planning and discussions with this. And so uh, the pleasure and honor are mine to be here. Now, I think it would be presumptuous for me to try to tell you at the College of Veterinary Medicine about veterinary medicine. Rather, the story I do have to tell is that in the weeks that we've been planning this, I've immersed myself into your archives and I've tried to learn about the heritage, the legends, the saga, uh, and the remarkable story of your College of Veterinary Medicine. And, and what I've, uh, this has included looking at some of the yearbooks and publications such as this cover that I have here. And also what, what has stood out to me is the wonderful sense of self and of humor that the CVM has. For example, uh, one of the uh, yearbooks, I believe is, uh, uh, has the name Vetsetra. Uh, another one said Zurotica. Uh, and this suggests to me a healthy sense of purpose and place. And also uh, I did immerse myself in the uh, fairly lengthy and fascinating personal history that the founding dean, uh, uh, Dean Terence Curtin, uh, wrote. So I've tried to learn 
uh, about your institutional heritage and your mission. What I would like to do today, and, and Sarah, next slide, please. And, and part of my, my immersion has included at least a virtual visit uh, to gain a sense of your, your environment, your architecture, and the spatial arrangements. And uh, it, it, it further uh, enhances the impression I have that I've gained from looking at the written documents or whatever. The sculptures are, are wonderful. And uh, on my bucket list is that after the restrictions of the virus and whatever are through, is that I would like to go from a virtual to an actual visit to your very, very attractive and inviting uh, campus, and particularly the CDM. So let me provide a little context where we step back from the College of Veterinary Medicine to some of the broader perspective and some of the uh, legacies that we associate with the land grants. And uh, much of this goes back to Senator Justin Morrill of Vermont, uh, for whom the act was named in 1862. Uh, and what's interesting is that he spent probably about 15 years uh, working on this act. And uh, it, was, it was only with uh, the Civil War and secession that he had enough votes to push through uh, the legislation. So there was regional differences and resistance. And if, if you had to ask me to cite uh, my favorite uh, artifact of the land grant legacy, it comes from the Saturday Evening Post in 1954. Uh, this uh, cover painting was by Norman Rockwell, one of the you know, revered American illustrators. And what attracts me to this uh, is, first of all, the, the, the name of the painting is called Breaking Home Ties. And it captures and conveys, uh, I think, the, the favorable a memorable strand of the land grant legacy. What we see is uh, uh, a rancher or farmer. If, if you look at his hands, they're obviously working hands. They're gnarled. Uh, he uh, certainly has not had the opportunity of uh, access to higher education. Yet to, to the side of him is his uh, son, a late adolescent, uh, who's, who's looking beyond the family farm probably looking away to uh, the state land grant college. And if you'll look at the suitcase uh, that uh, has all his uh, belongings and possessions, uh, there happens to be a red pennant with white letters and it says State U. So who knows, that could be North Carolina State University. And also I think fitting for the College of Veterinary Medicine, that's Lassie. Now this, this portrait or this painting uh, was done in 1954. And I have to break the news to Lassie that she's going to have to wait. Um, the College of Ver Veterinary Medicine at North Carolina State University is not going to be founded until 1978 and opened a few years later. So who knows? Maybe her, her offspring puppies <clears throat> are taking their pre-vet. Uh, but we'll all converge uh, in Raleigh. Uh, in a little time. So Lassie, be patient. Next slide, please. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that the, the land grant legacy has really been very uh, strong and dear uh, in our American heritage and uh, pretty difficult to have a, a postage stamp uh, in your honor. But here we find in some ways some of the, the precursors to our land grant institutions. Uh, we have uh, a stamp from 1955 commemorating Michigan State College and Pennsylvania State University. So once again, it's part of this accumulating uh, lore uh, and this kind of legend that our land grant colleges uh, have acquired over time. Next, please. Now, I think serious study has its place on the American campus. But this is what I would like to think, at least from the upper Midwest, their idea of a land-grant work ethic. Um, they've gone vegan, as you can see, 
And um, who knows, this may be the world's largest agronomy outdoor lecture class. Uh, but you know, all, all work and no play makes the corn husters uh, a dull cob. Next, please. And it, it's very difficult to uh, extricate our state colleges and universities from uh, our mascots and our logos. And so I, I went through several sites to uh, resurrect the uh, historic mascots from several uh, of the land grant colleges and universities. And looking at this rogues gallery, I felt like I was in the post office looking at uh, you know, the most wanted. A at least the Boilermakers are, are smiling, but there you have uh, the Purdue Boilermakers, you have the, uh, what is now Oklahoma State University, you have Pistol Pete, uh, there's a corn husker in one corner. And then down in the bottom right corner is uh, the Texas A&M, uh, the Aggie mascot. So what a game. But these have provided the historic visual image that we find at our athletic events and on decals and, and whatever. Usually when we think about the land grant legacy, the, the icon and the branding that comes to mind is that of A and M. And so I started to sort through this and what I thought was gonna be uh, a very, very short caption. Uh, it actually is pretty long. So what I've, I've tried to summarize here is what I call A and M from A to Z. So we start out A and M, usually that is interpreted as meaning agriculture and mechanics. And mechanics was uh, a 19th century term that we would usually uh, call engineering. But in digging further, I found that there, that there were many variations on M, agriculture and mechanics and mining. And then it went further to A and M and M and M, agriculture and mechanics and mining and military. I kept worrying that at this rate, they were gonna have a marching band of about 4,000 uh, and that it, at very least they should get some you know, royalties from M&M &M candy manufacturers or whatever. And to add to the A&M, we also have A&T, agriculture and technical, very, very important uh, for North Carolina. Uh, as, as one of its uh, uh, land grant institutions. So that's the, uh, the alphabet soup that you need to carry around as we go through the legacies and stories of the land grant institutions. Next, please. I wanna go back to the M standing for military. And uh, what we find is there is a strong American commitment to developing uh, civilian uh, education programs for future military leadership. And uh, here's one from uh, my own uh, University of Kentucky. Uh, this was at the time of World War I. And you can see uh, a rather extensive cadet corps in military training. What's interesting on the site where this is located uh, in, in the pre-coronavirus era, I would look out my office window uh, at the main lawn in front of, of the main administration building. And there was like a, a Monday, Wednesday, Friday routine, then a Tuesday, Thursday routine. And what it was, it's, uh, it probably will resume, I hope next year, is on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, ROTC and military cadets would train. Then on Tuesday, Thursday, uh, that same uh, land, uh, would go over to civil engineering, another one of our land grant programs. And there they'd be surveying. So every day I had to figure out, well, is this gonna be military drill or is it gonna be uh, you know, surveying? And, and what I would add is I feel that, we have that that piece of land is the most military safe protected place in the world. And then with the uh, civil engineering, it's the most surveyed real estate in the world. So I feel pretty safe. Next, please. And what's interesting in, in discussing our uh, land grant legacies is one measure of a healthy tradition 
is that it is allowed to be faithful and true to its historic purpose, yet at the same time uh, is resilient and is able to change as American society changes. So I, I uh, went into archives at Texas A&M and came up with two related but historically different and contrasting photographs of the Texas A&M Cadet Corps. Uh, uh, on the one side, the, uh, the historic uh, black and white photograph uh, shows uh, Texas A&M cadets, uh, I hope they're after drill. They didn't seem very disciplined there. I think they're off duty, but uh, they're uh, relaxing and enjoying themselves. Uh, and you'll notice uh, that it is all men. On the other side of the screen, we have uh, a, a, a photograph of the Texas A&M Cadet Corps uh, from the 21st century. And as you look at it, you'll notice uh, that the Cadet Corps once all men is now co-educational, men and women. And I find that uh, illustrative of a good, healthy uh, educational uh, and leadership uh, role. And, and one thing that's very important to note, if we go, go back one, one for a second, one, one interesting important note is that uh, Texas A&M in emphasizing the M for military, I believe that they have graduated and commissioned more US Army officers than West Point. Uh, so that's, that shows you how significant and substantial and how serious uh, that commitment to uh, educating future uh, military officers can be. Thank you. I want to make a special note of one of the most important land grant uh, universities. That is Cornell University in upstate New York. It's probably already started snowing there, so I had to get these photographs out soon. Uh, on the one hand, uh, there is the statue of the founder and major donor to Cornell, which is Ezra Cornell, and also the first and founding president. Andrew Dixon White. Truly, they were uh, a dynamic duo uh, in that um, the collaboration of Ezra Cornell's generosity and his vision, and then collaborating with uh, a very, very good academic leader. Uh, I, I would argue that Cornell University, uh, along with the uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, were probably the pace setters in terms of exemplary land-grant universities. What's interesting about Ezra Cornell, he made his fortune in developing the technology that would allow for the uh, string of, stringing of telegraph wire. And I believe that he at most had a sixth grade education. What's so fascinating about him is that his genuine commitment was that future generations of young Americans would have opportunities that he did not. Uh, he did not begrudge his lack of education, but he vowed to build upon that and to expand for others what he did not have. And it's interesting, Cornell uh, has the motto written by Ezra Cornell, that I would found an institution where anyone could study anything, only in America would we have that optimism and that generosity to extend and expand higher education. And in, in noting Cornell University, it's interesting and sometimes forgotten legacy is we, we tend today to identify our land grant colleges and universities almost exclusively with what we would call state colleges or public colleges and universities. But in fact, the uh, original framing of the land grant legislation was actually very generous and flexible. And it, it gave to each state uh, the latitude on how they would use the resources and funding that they had gained. And so if you look at uh, some of the original land grant institutions from the 1860s, if it's interesting to note, they are what we would consider today to be private colleges and universities. We have Cornell University, 
Dartmouth College, Transylvania University, which is in my town of Lexington, Kentucky, Yale University, and Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Now, I'm still trying to track down the agricultural extension plots for MIT. Um, I, I think there are some very good restaurants, and I think there's like one parking space uh, that's been allotted for uh, 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 soil and plant studies, but not much beyond that. But what is interesting is that uh, some of these private universities are still today very much the land-grant university of their state. In some cases, for example, in New Hampshire, uh, the state legislature uh, later created the University of New Hampshire uh, in Lexington, Kentucky, it led to creation of uh, Kentucky State College. And in Yale University was in Connecticut replaced by the University of Connecticut. So my point is there is some fluidity and change. And, and one other important note is often uh, the, the impression that exists in the public mind is that a land grant university meant that the state college received some actual plot of land. That, that, is, that is not accurate. What it was is that the federal government had the charge of trying to settle vast expanses of Western lands. And to encourage that, they allotted a formula to each state that allowed them to market and sell a certain amount of acreage or whatever, and, and the state could then uh, retain the proceeds from that and use that to establish the various land grant programs of the A&M. But, uh, but it was not an actual grant of land. And the other thing that's very important to note in, in our heritage is that there's increasing awareness that uh, the, the designation of public lands that would be sold that would lead to the land grant uh, institutions, uh, many of those were contested properties and controversial uh, as to, uh, to whom did the land belong. There's increasing uh, awareness and discussion uh, about um, the stewardship of Native Americans. And so that's an example of where uh, our legacies of the land grants are, are both a celebration and also a reconsideration uh, of our roots on that. Thank you. Now, what historians do is come across artifacts and fragments of information. And uh, it involves in some ways a great deal of uh, exploration and trying to solve puzzles. And one that has always fascinated me when we look at uh, a, a land grant university with its advanced research and development, how exactly did such advanced degree, pro degree programs such as the BS and the PhD come about? Now, I don't know the answer for sure, but I'd like to share with you some documents that I find interesting, if perhaps not accurate. Looking here at a Bureau of Agriculture <clears throat> Labor and Statistics report uh, from 1904-1905 from the state of Kentucky. Uh, I see here that Hubert Vreeland was the commissioner. Uh, I, I have no idea uh, about Hubert beyond that. But let us go on one more slide into the document. Here we have it, the Kentucky Fertilizer Law. This gave both the responsibility and the right to the land grant college uh, to uh, be in charge of analyzing and uh, certifying all fertilizer samples uh, in the state. Uh, and I think this was not only an example of better living through chemistry, it also, I'm sure, started out uh, with the BS degree. And of course, with advanced research, PhD, which as I'm sure you know from your own doctoral studies, meant piled higher and deeper. So I am indebted to them. Another part of the legacy of the land grants, I think worthy of note, as we go into the Midwest and we think of, of many of the universities we associate, for example, with the Big Ten Conference, 
Uh, at one time I visited the University of Illinois and I was hosted by the chancellor, which is their campus president. And it was remarkable, the, the awe and the reverence uh, is that the chancellor took time from his busy schedule to give me a, a personal tour uh, of one of the most sacred uh, plots of ground I've ever seen. And this is what we call the moral plots. It's in the center of campus. And as you can see on the sign, it says, University of Illinois, Morrow Plots, America's oldest experimental field, established in 1876. Results demonstrate that soil quality is a vital component of agricultural productivity. And what's interesting is that how universities, even though we're very modern, we're constantly looking forward to new technology, uh, new innovations, and yet there still is a very important place for respecting our heritage. And if I uh, may have the next slide, please. This is an aerial view of the Morrow plots. And it, it is right in the prime center of campus. And you, you can see some of it like an older building. But now what's important, all right, take a look at the next slide, please. This is the library, an undergraduate library that was built that overlooks the Moro plots. And I think this was constructed in the uh, mid 1970s. What you see is essentially a, a two story uh, magnificent structure. And, but you can also see the rows of corn and whatever. What this photograph does not reveal is the controversy over the library construction. The original plan was for, I believe, an eight story library. All the plans have been approved, architects have been paid, uh, contractors have been hired for construction. But at the last minute, someone pointed out that if they were to build that library to eight stories tall, it would cast a shadow on the historic moral plots and it would throw off the sunlight and the, uh, the, the growth and, and the, the sanctity uh, of the record keeping and whatever. So they changed from the eight story library plan to a two story and then included subterranean. So it's an example of where history does matter. Now, let me, before we leave the University of Illinois, and I've, I've celebrated them and praised them, there are, there are dark sides to the land grant legacy. For example, in the 1870s, when the mayor and citizens of Champaign, not to be mistaken with Urbana, when they found out that the, the legislature had awarded them uh, the land grant institution, they were at first very excited and happy. And the name of it was something like Illinois Institute. They thought they were gonna be the home of a new state prison and they liked that. They are actually grumbling and disappointed when they found out it was gonna be a college. I don't know, maybe it was an early concern about retention rates, I'm not sure, but it has worked out reasonably well since then. Now, one thing that's, that's very closely associated, I think with the, the rise and the growth and the popularity of our land grant institutions is it coincided very much with uh, the rise of big time college sports, uh, particularly football. And we find that, for example, uh, particularly right after World War I, uh, the incredible investment uh, in, in new large football stadiums. Now, if I had taken Latin, I would say stadia, but I'm gonna stick with my roots and say stadiums. Uh, and here we have, I, I believe this is from uh, University of Iowa, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but it does show from the 1920s and 1930s uh, how uh, it, it became very, very um, uh, common to have state universities with stadiums uh, seating 50,000, 60,000, and now we've expanded that more. Uh, but now uh, 
Earlier in my presentation, I mentioned all the variations on what is connoted by the term a and m. Uh, and, and one colleague uh, insisted that, that if the a and m tradition really were to be updated, uh, a and m should not necessarily be agriculture and mechanics, but perhaps in the 21st century, it should be athletics and money. That's a historian's puzzle. I will leave for you to, to decide. Now, another thing that I've noticed in about the last 10 or 15 years, particularly with some of the like 150th anniversary celebrations of the original land grant act is that university presidents and boards of trustees have invoked uh, the land grant legacy uh, to justify almost anything they wish to do. Saying like, well, after all, having a good parking lot, that after all helps fulfill our land grant legacy. And so what we find is, for example, that uh, various departments and programs around the campus, uh, they look at the popularity and success of, let us say, a College of Agriculture or of the College of Veterinary Medicine. And so many units around campus uh, try to hitch their wagon to invoking the land grant legacy. So let me show you next. Uh, here's what one enterprising uh, department did. Uh, I think this is accurate. Uh, is that uh, the geology department uh, was so enamored by state fairs with uh, agricultural productivity uh, is that they started to brag about their crop yield. And I, I think that this is the precursor to pet rocks uh, and obviously a tribute to a uh, good diet and uh, whatever there you have uh, the largest pet rock uh, in the world with of course all royalties going to the department of geology. So I hear. What I also would like to add in, along with reports on and data and statistics on enrollments, uh, on research grants and whatever, is there is a, a wonderful rich literary legacy uh, that comes about with our land grant colleges. There's a novel by Jane Smiley uh, from, uh, oh, I think about 10 or 12 years ago with the title Moo. And it's a delightful story that deals with thinly veiled, I believe it pertains to Iowa State University. And uh, it tells all the tales of, uh, of legend, lore, rivalries within the campus, all the secrets of uh, uh, the various departments. Uh, and it's, it's just one of many novels or memoirs that add uh, a, an interesting dimension to uh, the more academic statistics. But there is a, also a serious uh, legacy of the land grant colleges and universities in how they have transformed all, all of academic research and development. And going to this thing at the same campus of, of the novel Moo, looking at Iowa State University. Uh, during the Great Depression, it was one of the kind of early uh, times, first times that the federal government became seriously involved and concerned uh, about uh, systematic planning and data on, in this case, agricultural productivity, food distribution. Uh, in fact, uh, the origins and development of statistics as a distinct, serious field of academic study uh, came about in collaboration between what was then Iowa State College and the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, in 1938. And so here we are uh, in the 21st century. We would be hard pressed to name a college or university that did not have a Department of Statistics. And so this is a, a legacy of the land grants that I think warrants uh, celebration and acknowledgement and sometimes gets overlooked. Even though we measure the land grant legacy with the original 1862 Morrill Act that, that we, we glanced at a little bit earlier, 
Uh, what often is, is left out of the historical record is that, is that the land grant colleges and their programs started in the 1860s really faced uh, a lot of problems. Often there was reluctance, uh, for example, from farmers uh, to uh, listen to or trust college experts. Uh, also, the funding that came from the original Morrill Act was very uneven. As I mentioned earlier, uh, each state uh, was allowed to keep the proceeds of land sales from the far west. But states were very diverse and varied in how well they marketed that land for sale. Uh, states such as I think like New York did very, very well. Uh, many states had very meager returns. Uh, I mentioned uh, the University of Illinois uh, where citizens actually wanted a prison rather than a college. Uh, so it was really tough going. And what, what happens uh, fortuitously is in 1887 at Pennsylvania State College, uh, they name uh, as president George Atherton, uh, who you, you see a uh, picture here. He had a background in what we would call political science. And what he grasped very perceptively was that the scattered, fragmented land grant program really needed some presence in Washington, DC. So he convenes several of, the, of his colleagues who are land grant presidents throughout uh, the nation. And they form what really is the first higher education trade group or lobbying group that would have an office uh, and a representative in Washington, DC. And he, he serves as president of, of Pennsylvania State College, which we now know as Pennsylvania State University from 1887 to 1906. And he is also the leader of the land grant presidents in Washington, DC. DC, and it is, is truly transforming in terms of the latter legislation that he and his colleagues present to Congress uh, in, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Next slide, please. So if we look at that era, the, the federal legislation and programs that really energize and transform the land grant colleges from rather small scale uh, enterprises into having a strong enduring presence. One is the creation of the uh, trade association, the American Association of Agri -college, Agricultural Colleges and Experiment Stations in 1887. And that, that name has gone through several modifications, uh, but it's essentially still uh, very alive and active. The same time also would be the Hatch Act of 1887, which introduces uh, experimental research stations uh, uh, that, that are supported with uh, very generous federal funding. Very important is the second moral act, the Agricultural College Act of 1890. And then also added research funding coming from the Smith-Lever Act of 1914. So it's this succession of sustained attention to public policy, uh, persuading Congress and governors uh, of the need for uh, expanding and extending federal support for state colleges. Next, please. And, and here I have from, from uh, the University of Kentucky uh, this what was at the time magnificent building, the Agricultural Experiment Station, which uh, I believe was built in the early 1900s. It was by far the grandest building. It was the icon of the campus. It was interesting is that, that uh, all the postcards, brochures, uh, whenever they wanted to showcase uh, the University of Kentucky, they didn't feature uh, the main administration building they featured the Ag Experiment Station, just kind of a, a tribute to the enduring presence, both in architecture and in programs and in funding that the land grants brought to their campuses. 
Now, with, with the success of, of large scale, serious research and development, part of the legacy of the land grants is not only the success, but also some of the controversies. Uh, and, and here I've, I've tried to depict what I would call square tomatoes. Uh, I, I did my graduate work at the University of California, Berkeley, and I recall vividly uh, that one of the enduring uh, issues and at times controversies was that uh, one of the major contributions of research and development from the university uh, was that of the square tomato uh, that could be um, uh, picked mechanically by harvesters and replacing handpicking and labor. And so, so what we find is that the, the land grant legacy becomes both uh, positive and also contentious. And there'll be other you know, related issues. One thing I've tried to do is I try to be on the lookout for what I call land grant heroes. Who are some of the, the really towering figures that have, have come out of our various uh, programs? Uh, as students and also uh, later as researchers and faculty. And one of my favorites is John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, who probably is considered one of the most influential economists uh, of the 20th century uh, and, and his entire teaching career was at Harvard. But I read his memoir and he was, he was a poor boy from uh, rural Canada and uh, he was impoverished. And uh, he, he fortuitously received uh, a fellowship uh, to study at Berkeley for his PhD. And it's interesting is that he was known worldwide in his professional and teaching career as an economist. He always pointed out, he studied agricultural economics. And in his memoir, he, he talked about how uh, graduate students in the economics department would be talking about uh, international tariffs. Uh, his role as a graduate assistant was check local supermarkets on what the price of prunes were, uh, which was actually very important to the California economy. Um, uh, but, but just an example of the diversity of talent that has come from the land grant legacy. Next, please. Also, I, I wanna mention uh, a dimension that we talk about the changing composition of our students. And earlier, I had the slide of Texas A&M Cadet Corps, the change from, let's say, 1910 to 2010, in terms of the Cadet Corps originally uh, exclusive to men, uh, eventually became men and women. And there's an interesting uh, characterization of the way that women were treated as students and as faculty and staff in their early decades, land grants. It's called, they were often called the academic kitchen. The study done by a, a colleague of mine, Marisi Nayrad, uh, she wrote a historical study, but in fact, she was considered probably the top statistical institutional researcher in the nation. And she was uh, head of uh, institutional research at Berkeley, and then constantly on loan to uh, agencies in Washington, DC. But she was struck by uh, the, the uh, biographies and programs and the experiences of women in the late 19th and early 20th century at the land grants. Next, please. And here is, here is uh, an added hero uh, that relates to the book uh, by Marisi Nayrad. This is Agnes Faye Morgan. She was the first woman to receive a PhD from the University of Chicago, and it was in chemistry. She accepted a faculty appointment at the University of California, Berkeley. And her uh, assignment was as a professor and then to be the founding department chair of home economics, which would be a very, very important part of the land grant uh, programs. In her own research and work, she would gain international fame and applause uh, for her work in chemistry and the rudiments of biochemistry, particularly in uh, nutrition research, development of vitamins. But her personal experience as department chair and trying to develop a program uh, was not completely happy. Uh, 
she tried to develop and make the case that home economics should be uh, a very scientific field, that it should be dealing with uh, large problems on a large scale. And so although she faced great success in her own work, she was constantly obstructed, thwarted, and denied to gain ample funding to develop rigorous scientific programs in her department. Next, please. Another one of my heroes is from University of Kentucky, Roots, uh, Sarah Gibson Blanding. Uh, it was interesting, she was uh, a faculty member at the University of Kentucky, uh, also in home economics. She also, by the way, was the uh, basketball coach of the really winning team on campus at that time, the women's team, uh, and one year was undefeated, but they, they did not allow spectators at their games. Uh, she would go on to be the Dean of home, e home Economics and Nutrition at Cornell University. I believe that was the first time at a major American research university that a woman was named as an academic dean. Then she would go on to be president of Vassar College. Uh, and in 1947, uh, President Harry Truman appointed a blue ribbon uh, commission on the future of American higher education in a democracy. And she was one of two women in this commission, I believe of, of 30 uh, to be appointed. Uh, so her legacy as a land grant hero as, is as a president, professor, dean, and coach. A bit earlier, I was mentioning the legislation and programs that came about uh, starting in 1887 and spanning into the 1920s. I want to go back to highlight one of those, the second land grant act in 1890. What's important to note is that it really did institutionalize our educational and legislative policies of separate but unequal. The background of the Second Land Grant Act of 1890 is that it was uh, an effort to extend to the former Confederate states the programs and funding that had been available to states that were in the Union in 1862. And if you read through its language, it is uh, very decisive in saying that to be eligible uh, for this federal program, a state must vouch that it provides uh, access to its state colleges and universities without regard to race. However, there was a codicil that said, if you do not wish to ascribe to that, we will allow you a provision on the condition that you provide separate and equal racial exclusive land grant colleges. And this will refer to 17 states. Certainly uh, obvious, we think of the South and states in the South. Interesting to me was that uh, that pertained to states that had racially exclusive uh, statutes uh, of education, public education. It stretched, it included Delaware, and it goes as far west as Oklahoma and Texas. So it was a, a substantial swath uh, of, of American uh, statehood. And the, the Legacy, I think, since 1890 is it's, it's inescapable uh, that, in fact, the record of our state governments has been in establishing historically black colleges and universities as part of the land grant. It really has been separate but unequal. Uh, I, I wish I were wrong on that. Uh, but that is an American dilemma. And one interesting interpretation of the second land grant act of 1890 is that it was on the vanguard of formalizing and institutionalizing essentially what would become to be known as Jim Crow. 
They were not following practices. They were initiating them. And so that is an American dilemma. Uh, and that is uh, the complexities of the multiple legacies that we carry away uh, in our land grant tradition. So as is fitting, I think, with this incredible series of events and speakers that you have organized, it means that a, a, an important part of the land grant legacies, plural, is that we rediscover and reckon with race. Next, please. The, the analyst and kind of public intellectual who has shaped my research is Stephen Wright, uh, who uh, was born in 1910. He died in 1996. Uh, he was from Virginia. He had served as president of several historically black colleges and universities. Uh, he was uh, an incredibly uh, insightful and respected diplomat, working with groups in Washington, D.C. and in many states. Uh, and at one time, he was uh, uh, president of the United Negro College Fund. So he, he worked in philanthropy, he worked as a uh, historian, uh, he was a professor, uh, and he also was uh, the president. And what's interesting in his speeches uh, is that he brought increased attention, particularly in the 1980s, to the often overlooked legacies of our land grant institutions uh, in the historically black colleges and universities. And, and by the way, in, in preparing for my talk, uh, I came across, I noticed that I believe in October this month uh, includes the celebration of the 75th anniversary of the College of Veterinary Medicine at Tuskegee University. Next slide, please. And I think also pertinent to this uh, program uh, hosted uh, by the CVM is uh, acknowledgement as a legacy uh, from the Second Moral Act. We have in, in your home state of North Carolina, the founding uh, and start of North Carolina A&T. And I, I went through archives uh, and here's a, a photo, I, I, it's undated. I believe it is from uh, the 1890s of students and teachers uh, in class at North Carolina A&T, an institution that is, as with most land grants, has gone through numerous name changes to reflect their changing and expanding missions and roles. Thank you. And another uh, photograph of uh, uh, students and instruction at North Carolina A&T, and the, this would be in the er early uh, 1900s. And here we have a, a, an alum, alumni gathering of North Carolina A&T. And I believe this is from around 1915. Uh, so it's, it's a, a strand, an important strand uh, of the land grant legacies that warrants our acknowledgement. And it, it certainly uh, adds to our topics of conversation. Thank you. And this is uh, from, from uh, nearby Lexington, Kentucky, uh, Kentucky State University, actually it was Kentucky State College at the time. Uh, the irony is uh, University of Kentucky is in Lexington, Kentucky State University is in Frankfurt, uh, all of uh, 30 miles away. Uh, and yet, I think that it's fair to say that that's the longest 30 miles in the world. Next, please. So I hope that my remarks have combined both uh, celebration, but also reconsideration as we look through the rich and complex legacies. And as I noted early uh, in my talk, for, for me, uh, I am learning about the legacy of colleges of veterinary medicine. Uh, that is for you to educate me. And so I hope you envision uh, a conversation. And let me just give one example. I believe it's about five years ago, New York Times front page lengthy article started on the front page and went for at least one or two more pages further in the first section 
uh, and it featured College of the Veterinary Medicine. And their emphasis was on the demographics of student enrollment. And I, it, it, it just jumped out at me. It said the, the enrollment in College of the Veterinary Medicine uh, was over 90% women. And I, I had no contact, no grounding for that. So that's the kind of thing where, where you who are the uh, students, faculty, staff, alums, and major donors, uh, those are just one, one example of the saga and story that you have to discuss and to tell and that you may know well, but is not at all necessarily known or obvious to uh, the larger university community or the American public. So uh, I hope that my remarks have uh, been prefaced to uh, a good uh, discussion and conversation. Great, thank you, Dr. Thielen. We what have a few questions. We have a few questions and just a few minutes for these questions. But one of the first questions are, are land grants still relevant to today's economy and academic environment? Yes and no. That's my, that's my equivalent of a and M. Uh, they are, but l let me give it one example. I, I pay great attention to symbols, statues, icons, or whatever. And, and what I think is that, that many land-grant institutions uh, deal with such things as naming. Like, for example, colleges of agriculture uh, are starting to, to change their name to try to reflect expanded services. And they go through great internal rediscussions of that. Um, so so my, my serious answer is yes, of course they are relevant and they are essential, but, but not at all in the, the format or the themes of, let's say, from, from 1910. Okay. And the next question is related to that question, but it says, what do you see as the path forward for historically white land grants in reckoning with race? How do we better understand and how do we better acknowledge and address this legacy? I, I, I talk is not cheap, but I think the conversation is important. And one thing that, that stood out to me in looking over the uh, publicity materials and announcements for, for your series is that uh, the College of Veterinary Medicine has indeed taken the lead in extending its discussion and its invitations. And so I think that collaboration uh, across and between institutions and uh, genuine acknowledgement uh, is, is the key. And that, that, that's not particularly specific, but I think it's a start. Okay. And I think just time for this one final question. It says the original land grants were established in 1862 the HBCUs were established in 1890. Why the disparity in funding? Uh, my, my answer for that is that the, the federal monies that accompanied a, a land grant designation, first of all, it varied a great deal from state to state depending on how they had marketed the land sale. Now with 1890, right, my, my, my my estimate on, on, if you look total funding of a given land grant campus, one stream or strand is gonna be whatever the federal appropriation is. But I think that overall the campus budget, whether it be for North Carolina State University or whether it be for North Carolina A&T, the majority of the budget is gonna come from state funding. The, the, the federal funding is one strand, but it is, it is, it is a, a Substantial, but but not the, at all the major funding. So states, whether it be in their public school systems or in their land grant colleges, uh, had great um, opportunity and many states opted for separate but unequal funding. And I think that pattern carried through many, many states. Okay. 
I think that's all the time that we have for questions for today. Thank you again for being here with us and for the talk. And uh, someone, I think Dr. Dunning commented earlier, we would definitely welcome you to come visit us in the future whenever it's uh, feasible again. Arf. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for your hospitality. <laughs>